Okay, so uh, we'll pick up today where we left off last class, and uh, streaming is up and running. Um, we are looking ahead to next Tuesday when the TV package assignment is due. And uh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll repeat myself again, uh, but um, <clears throat> the idea of the TV package is that you'll take your radio feature and uh, rewrite it now as a television package, uh, incorporating uh, a second source. So some new material has to go into it. And you'll probably have to cut out some of your radio feature, cut it down a bit uh, to fit into the new format with the TV package. So you would be picking another source, whether it's an additional person to interview. Nick was talking about, um, you know, remember Nick covered a wrestling event at his old high school where a high school grad who's now a pro wrestler, wrestler came back. Um, and we were just talking about who might be a good second source. And Nick was thinking, yeah, maybe a student who attended the show who can talk about, you know, not just whether it was an entertaining show, but also was it, was it interesting for folks to see somebody who's made a success of themselves coming back to high school and, uh, you know, sharing, sharing some of their knowledge with, uh, with the other students uh, who are there now. So, so I think that would be a great second source. So thinking about your story, um, you know, who would be a good second source? And if you don't feel that another person, another interview would add to it, then what additional uh, secondary sources would be appropriate? Like what kind of information written in other news uh, or other kinds of documentation that you can find would be appropriate? <clears throat> uh, would, and basically, how do you know if it's appropriate? I mean, think through your story as a radio feature. What is it that your audience wants to know about it? Like what more do they want to know? Uh, it's almost as, as soon as you start telling the story, if it's interesting, they're going to have more questions. So try to anticipate those questions. How can you answer those questions? How can you give, give people more information? What do they want to know about? So think, what does your audience want to know? And that will lead you to what is appropriate <clears throat> to add in. You know? So JP, what, what's happening with yours? Because I know you're... I'm just going to expand on it. On the A story, but and and so you're going to be giving more contextual information, I guess, because you can't get any more people to talk to. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there's a there's a lot to be said about development in San Francisco, right? So you would be drawing on that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's something that you can do with that. And remember, after the TV package, which is due on Tuesday, but everyone is invited in for a mandatory class next Thursday where we'll read some more of them. Um, I'm going to ask you for the final leg of this series of assignments to, you'll have two weeks to turn it into a web uh, story, uh, which will have more features that we'll talk about um, next Thursday when I present to you that part of the assignment. So that'll involve gathering a little bit more stuff and thinking through how you could change your story to work on the web. Uh, which is quite different than working in either the audio or the video medium. So we'll talk about that next Thursday, and everyone has to be in class next Thursday, so we have a chance to talk about that. Um, yeah, so apart from the second source, there's kind of a long list of things that um, we should remind you about here. And uh, let us go, and let us also see if there's any questions coming up in chat that... Uh, Okay, so, so far it looks kind of quiet there, so that's cool. So I'm working through people's radio features. Probably I'll finish them tonight because I got some free time finally after all of this midterm craziness and stuff. Uh, so what I could note from just general, this may or may not apply specifically to what you wrote, um, and you'll see my specific comments about it. But just in general, uh, I think we could still work towards more concision. So looking through what you've done and making sure that you're not repeating yourself, making sure that what goes into your story is only the most important stuff and the kind of secondary things fall by the wayside. 
Uh, and as I said, when you move from a two minute radio feature and many people wrote a little bit too long, like they already have two and a half minutes uh, as a radio thing, when you try to put this into two and a half minutes in television with another source, you're gonna have to cut it down. So uh, first up, you're gonna have to be more concise. You're gonna have to cut it shorter. You're gonna have to decide what is the core of the story and then leave some things apart. Uh, and very often what's taking up a lot of space are actualities, which are kind of, you know, they may be a little bit too long, they may be 30 seconds long, and you could cut them down to 15 seconds. Uh, they may be just, they sounded good, but they don't really impact on the information that you're giving. Either way, cut them down or cut them out. If there is information in the actuality that you don't want to sacrifice, paraphrase. Okay, so you can work that information very easily into the connecting passages that you write for the reporter to stick together the actualities. So that's the best way to shorten stuff. And as you bring in a second source, you may find that it changes the focus of the story a little bit or tightens it up. So number one, based on what I'm seeing, which was already long and in some cases um, uh, a little bit too wordy, shorten things up, make it more concise. Um, and you'll see in my direct comments to you if that really applies to you. And then the other thing is more conversational yet again. In television, people are already half listening to what you're saying. They're watching pictures. Um, so very complex information in the video track is going, you know, is, is going to make it um, hard for people. So write more conversationally yet again. You know? uh, that said, you can probably you know, your first step will always be to evaluate what's in the radio feature and bring it into the video on the audio column side and then start editing there and cutting it down and making it shorter. So, but you're definitely going to draw on what you did in your radio feature. And if that means you need to go back to the interview that you did for the feature, that's great. You may want to pull out different uh, sound bites for this exercise. Okay. Uh, otherwise, remember, um, you're going to have uh, uh, the anchor introducing the show, uh, a reporter stand-up, right? So the first thing we do is we go to the reporter. No need to see, uh, um, you know, I'm coming to you live from out in front of City College, Ocean Campus. You're not coming live. This is a pre-recorded package. So just, uh, you know, the reporter stand-up. You don't need to refer to uh, time and place or anything. Just start in with the story. Um, and then you're going to, uh, you know, eventually uh, cut into uh, what's basically like an extended VOSOT where you're talking over pictures and then you stop for actuality, sound bites, and then you're talking over more pictures. Um, some stories would have a, uh, a reporter's stand up in the middle of it again, but you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, and then, you know, uh, the don't forget a lockout at the end. And um, that's it. Otherwise, the content, you know, probably will be pretty much what you did in the radio feature. So uh, just a, a, a shortened version with additional sources in there. Okay, so clear on that, right? Okay, so. I wanted to look at a couple of couple more. All right, um, so uh, NBC, the San Jose NBC affiliate, distinguishes itself in terms of news here in the Bay Area by doing investigative pieces. That means original reporting. And uh, these run longer than the two and a half minute package, which is your assignment, uh, largely because you know they are um, breaking news. They're not just reporting typically an event or a profile. Uh, they're trying to do topical information, which means they're, they're often dealing with more uh, complex stories and sometimes with, um, with more information uh, than the average package has in it. So I'm just looking through what might be a, uh, an interesting one to try out. This one from Thursday, October 19th might be interesting. Let's check it out. So when we talk about investigative pieces, uh, as I said, the, the, the idea here is that you're breaking new information. You're um, following up on stories. And, and so these take more time than your average TV package, which is usually done within a day. 
you get the assignment in the morning and you know you go out shoot put it together in the afternoon and it's on the air by the evening but uh, these investigative packages may require a reporter to work for a few days before something actually comes out on TV. And they may have additional help. There may be several people involved in writing the story, like a reporter who does the interviews, and a staff writer who actually writes the thing. Um, so they're, they're longer, they're more involved, and they also will sometimes use different sources of information, which is, I think, interesting for you guys. It's like, well, you're, you're working with a document. How do they wind up working with a document? And in fact, on that, maybe there's a better story than the water story. Um, dealing with, I saw one of these which had, what they typically do is when they talk about a document, they <clears throat> have a document on camera. Here we go. Three former Tesla factory workers allege racial discrimination. So that's good. That's local. It's got real people. And there's also clearly some kind of documentation. So. Volume all the way up there, 48. Uh, is there volume on the player? Probably, something here. That's a little down. Okay, my player's up, my computer's up, my projector's up. <laughs> I think this is as loud as it gets. It didn't sound very loud. Workers and in some cases supervisors routinely call them the N word. Investigative reporter Liz Wagner has been solving problems inside the Fremont factory all year and has details of this new development. Owen Diaz couldn't wait to work for Tesla. A staffing agency got him a job as an elevator operator inside the Fremont factory in June of 2015. He says almost immediately his co workers began to harass him. They started calling him. <laughs> and uh, telling me to go back to Africa, which I found kind of funny because I was born in Pasadena. Diaz also <laughs> says he found drawings like this one placed around the facility, depicting derogatory images of African Americans. He says he tried to ignore it, but what happened to his son nearly broke him. Dimitri Diaz, just 19 at the time, worked on the production line. I was kind of the corner. I was coming down to, to get my son his lunch. And his supervisor started calling him an effing nigga. And you saw this? I saw this. I heard this. How did you even deal with that? It's my son. It's my son. Every time it happened, I'm letting someone know. Both men say they complained to their staffing agencies and supervisors. Owen sent this email to his boss saying he didn't feel safe around a co-worker he says harassed him. But they say nothing changed until Dimitri was let go a few months after he started and Owen quit. You walked away. Yes. You couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't take it anymore, no. A third complainant is also named in the suit against Tesla and the staffing agencies. And these aren't the first workers to make allegations of harassment and retaliation. It made me feel less than a man. Earlier this year, this man came forward after employees made a threatening video. You would take your pound <laughs> shake you up in pieces. Tesla's managing counsel told us the company started an investigation but failed to see it through until months later when Tesla finally took action against the men in the video. This time around, the company declined an interview request but says it takes every form of discrimination and harassment extremely seriously. Tesla says in this case, it's found no evidence the men made complaints about racist language and says none of the workers ever brought a claim until now. The company is questioning why the men didn't first make discrimination allegations to regulators and claims the attorney handling the case is preparing a negative media campaign against Tesla. This conduct is illegal. Attorney Larry Oregon is representing the workers. I think that there's a failure to uh, educate the workers at the Tesla plant about what conduct is acceptable and what conduct is not acceptable. Owen Diaz says he hopes his voice will force a culture change at Tesla. To help them, you know, be able to go to work and be able to Go home happy. Liz Wagner, NBC Bay Area News. Fishing with both Robert and Walnut Just Creek stop. police say the man they Right. That's a pretty bad story. I mean a pretty I mean as far as news goes, it's a well told news item, but it's a pretty horrible story. Let's just see how long that ran. Just That was three minutes. That was three minutes, was it? Okay. So that's not much longer than what we're covering. 
Some of these go way longer. We can look at another one there. Um, so uh, uh, probably we're going to want to watch it again in a sec just to start looking through some of what was done there. But wh what are your reactions to it so far? Apart from the story itself, like the facts reported. Said. They did very little talking heads. They would only put them like in doses, but the rest of it was VO. Gotcha. Okay, so so it had that VOSOT structure as well, and and it certainly wasn't just one long SOT, right? Yeah, yeah. Proportionately, was it about the same balance that you would find in any package in terms of SOTs to VO, or was there more VO? There was a little more VO. Okay, yeah, I, I think so too because there was a lot more context. Yes, and. JP, exactly, there's more context. Right, and not all of that came from people talking to us. Some of it came from uh, email exchanges. Uh, you saw the, what we could assume would be the, uh, you know, something like the lawyer's brief or something that. Um, oh, it's a video. Uh-huh, what, Nick? The video of um, those. Um, oh, those, saying okay. That. In words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so if we were to make a uh, a, um, a list of B-roll, we saw documents. We saw video, like cell phone video. We saw an online video as well. Right, yeah. Did you notice where that was from? That was from NBC News. Yes. So. Just reminding us in a subtle way that they've been on the story for a while, I think, is they, they showed the, the full page with uh, the video embedded in it instead of just showing us a straight video. That's a good takeaway. Very observant. That's good. So uh, other ideas? It's short. Let's look at it again just to see how it's done. Well, there are new allegations tonight of racist language at Tesla. In a lawsuit filed today, three former workers, all black men, claim that co-workers and in some cases supervisors routinely call them the N-word. Investigative reporter Liz Wagner has been following problems inside the Fremont factory all year and has details of this new development. Owen Diaz couldn't wait to work for Tesla. A staffing agency got him a job as an elevator operator inside the Fremont factory in June of 2015. He says almost immediately his co-workers began to harass him. They started calling me and uh, telling me to go back to Africa, which I found kind of funny because I was born in Pasadena. Diaz also says he found drawings like this one placed around the facility depicting derogatory images of African Americans. He says he tried to ignore it, but what happened to his son nearly broke him. Dimitri Diaz, just 19 at the time, worked on the production line. I was turning the corner. I was coming out here to get my son his lunch, and his supervisor started calling him that effing And you saw this? I saw this. I heard this. How did you even deal with that? It's my son. It's my son. Every time it happened, I'm letting someone know. Both men say they complained to their staffing agencies and supervisors. Owen sent this email to his boss saying he didn't feel safe around a co-worker he says harassed him. But they say nothing changed until Dimitri was let go a few months after he started and Owen quit. You walked away. Yes. You couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't take it anymore, no. A third complainant is also named in the suit against Tesla and the staffing agencies. And these aren't the first workers to make allegations of harassment and retaliation. It made me feel this little weird. Earlier this year, this man came forward after employees made a threatening video. You would take your own house and you shake you up in pieces. Tesla's managing counsel told us the company started an investigation but failed to see it through until months later when Tesla finally took action against the men in the video. This time around, the company declined an interview request but says it takes every form of discrimination and harassment extremely seriously. Tesla says in this case, it's found no evidence the men made complaints about racist language and says none of the workers ever brought a claim until now. 
The company is questioning why the men didn't first make discrimination allegations to regulators and claims the attorney handling the case is preparing a negative media campaign against Tesla. This conduct is illegal. Attorney Larry Organ is representing the workers. I think that there's a failure to uh, educate the workers at the Tesla plant about what conduct is acceptable and what conduct is not acceptable. Owen Diaz says he hopes his voice will force a culture change at Tesla. To help them, you know, be able to go to work and be able to go home happy. Liz Wagner, NBC Bay Area News. All right, before we get distracted by that next story. So uh, I tried to sketch out a little bit of the structure of it, but is there any other things that you found structurally? Did you notice a kind of a circular structure there? Ryan's nodding, yeah. Yeah, you, it was pretty circular, it came back around. Yeah, at, at the end, you start off with Owen sort of stating the problem, you come back to Owen sort of saying, uh, so people can come away happy, yeah. I thought it was way, it was three minutes. Yes, yeah, three minutes. I thought it was yeah. way shorter than that. Huh. It's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that they throw up there to keep you interested, yeah. Because yeah. some of the VO, when it comes to showing documents and stuff like that, I guess this is in part what I wanted to show you, is some of the strategies used to keep it interesting, even if you're talking about what was said in an email, what was in a court document, right? <clears throat> and I hadn't realized that the cell phone video as well as the uh, bit of interview that we're seeing in sort of as, as though they captured the video off of their website. So th those were both part of a previous story of somebody else who'd made similar allegations. And stuff. So, so that's, it's, it's rare that you see TV following up on a story. Usually TV packages, TV reporting just go out there and it's done and thank you very much and that's it. But again, because this is, you know, the investigative unit. Um, they have more time and they seem to have like more, more continuity in what they do, so they'll follow up a story like this. Other thoughts about, about this? So how could you use some of what we're looking at in, in, in your rewrite? By the way, we didn't see a stand-up, right? So this is different than some other packages where there is a reporter standing up in the beginning just working their way into the package, but here, no stand-up. The reporter, you know, when we see her, it's because she's asking questions in the interview. Right. And that's another difference of this uh, particular style that they're using as well. You know, usually we see, like Captain Azuelo, we don't see the reporter asking a question. We don't see a QA part. We usually just see the SOT without a question in there, right? But we're, what we're seeing here is the journalist actually appearing on camera, you know, with a, a reverse angle shot. You see Owen, but then you also see her expressing her horror at what he had to go through or asking an additional question. So in this way, the reporter uh, is becoming a bit more of a character that we see, you know, involved in the story which is something that reporters, TV reporters really go after because uh, they want to be on camera and they want to get known and they want to be important in their way. So uh, other thoughts? So, so we, didn't, we did not see, so we saw no stand-up. And we did see questions, which is rare. <clears throat> well, and a lot of things about this, of course, are are special because these are their investigative stories. Other thoughts on this one? Let's check out another one just uh, again we're going like almost completely out of, off of uh, a lot of these are uh, I feel like dead wildlife. I don't want to hear another one about people of color or women being abused. <laughs> Uh, the jewelry store one? Is that a package? No, that's a short one. Where is that? The one that came after, the one that played after the racial discrimination. Oh yeah, that's just a real short one there. That's like a voiceover. Yeah, probably, yeah. 
Uh, I'm looking more for the extended packages. Something deadly. This one's and six minutes long. Of the San Francisco Bay. And it is killing thousands of sharks. Scientists aren't sure how to stop it from spreading to other sea life, including the fish you eat. So what's behind the shark deaths? Investigative reporter Bagad Shaban found out more from the waterfront. The San Francisco Bay is home to a complex ecosystem. The wildlife is interconnected. And so even though this area stretches 1,600 square miles, when one species suffers, others can too. And here along the waterfront, scientists now believe there's a deadly threat that lies beneath. Hidden in the beauty of the bay is a cruel mystery that's leaving thousands of sharks disoriented or dead. We have to find out what's killing these sharks. Dr. Andy Nozel is a marine biologist and a top expert on leopard sharks, the main species that's washing up dead. In just five months, an estimated one to 2,000 leopard sharks die in the bay. I'm concerned whether this is going to spread. Are we going to start seeing this up and down the coast of California? And the answer to that right now is we don't know. And I think that's what's the scariest part. Field work on sharks is rare. So Dr. Nozel and his research partner invited us aboard their boat in San Diego for a first-hand look. So right now we're heading to a known leopard shark hotspot. We have a leopard shark right here. Nozel catches and releases them as part of his research on their movements. Here we go again. The team takes measurements, blood samples, and attaches tracking tags. The shark's eyes are covered to reduce stress. Nozel's research is completely funded by private donors and focuses on sharks' swimming patterns, not their mysterious demise. So he says it's crucial California dedicate resources to investigate what exactly is killing them. If we don't find out, then there's nothing we can do about it. Sharks are naturally buoyant, which means unless they're actively swimming, their bodies sink. So sharks infected that die in deep water may never wash up on shore. The sharks you see are just a small fraction of the sharks that are actually uh, dying in the bay. Dr. Mark Okihiro should know. He's the one keeping count. He's the state's one-man science team trying to find out what's preying on California sharks. Similar deaths date back 50 years and have been unexplained. But Okahiro believes he's turning the tide. His research now points to a parasite. It's called Miamiensis avidus. It sneaks in through a shark's nose and slowly eats away at the brain, oftentimes causing sharks to beach themselves. But this year, it's not just sharks washing ashore. Up to 500 bat rays, hundreds of striped bass, 50 smooth hound sharks, and about 100 halibut, all dead. So it's possible the parasite is spreading. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable uh, assumption. Investigating the cause isn't actually Okahiro's job. He's officially in charge of assessing the health of white sea bass for California's Department of Fish and Wildlife but he's been researching shark deaths during his spare time, and he does it from home. He examines shark tissue on his dining room table. Probably have to wash this cloth before Thanksgiving. <laughs> Studies bacteria samples in his kitchen and does shark necropsies on his patio. Over a thousand sharks are dead. Different types of sharks and fish are now getting infected and the center of the research effort to find out why is here in your backyard. Well, in fish and wildlife, we're, we're spread pretty thin. We have a lot of constraints on how our programs are funded. Gabe Tiffany oversees the budget and accounting for California's Department of Fish and Wildlife. He's a deputy director, and the agency said he could best answer our questions. Right now, California is relying on a guy who's checking shark tissue samples in his dining room. Doesn't that seem strange to you? I have no knowledge of, of how his day-to-day -day work, you know, operations work. So, I can't answer that. You're not aware that he's doing any of the science in his living room? I didn't know that. In his kitchen? In his backyard? <laughs> cool. No, not at all. Our understanding is that there isn't any funding for that specific stuff. Well, we're going to have to get back to that. They did, and it turns out the agency dedicates zero dollars to researching these shark deaths. 
The legislature and governor could approve additional funds. But until that happens, the department says it's putting resources elsewhere, like other higher risk wildlife. Leopard sharks aren't threatened or endangered, and they're some of the most abundant sharks off the California coast. But Andy Nozel says that makes them canaries in a sort of Bay Area coal mine. When they die and wash ashore, it's pretty obvious we see it. But what about all the other species that perhaps are getting sick and dying and simply sinking to the bottom that we just don't know about? There's a lot more at stake here than just leopard sharks. And the number of shark deaths peaked back in April and May. It seems to spike during the rainy months. Some believe that's because a fair amount of pollution washes into the bay after a rainfall, which can compromise a shark's immune system, leaving it too weak to fight off infection. As for what's leaving other species vulnerable, no one knows for sure. And guys, for now, the state has no plans to put any money behind finding an answer. No, if you have a story for our investigative unit, call. That number, 888-996-TIPS, or send us an email to the unit at NBCBayArea.com. A lot of... Cool. Okay. What would you think about that one? Pretty, like, I don't know what word for it, but, like, condensed or dense or something. Okay. Because, like, of all the voiceover SOT, like, I counted, and there were 12 SOTs and... 11 voiceovers. Thank you for counting. That's great. Yeah. So you felt it's a lot of information. It was. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true too. Yeah. Did other people feel that or? Yeah, it was six minutes. Yeah. So it's a long, it's a long piece to pay that much attention to on TV, I guess, is in part the story. But, but I, I I mean, I, we dip into this every semester around this class to sort of see, you know, what, what longer extended uh, packages seem like. And, and uh, you know, very often we find packages that start to butt up against our ability to process all that information in this oral form. You know, the, I mean, maybe we'll come on to another one if we look at another one. Um, but I remember last semester coming on to one which was full of very, you know, precise facts and figures and there was no way we could hang on to it, you know. And, and I think they're aware of that too. Um, and uh, you'll notice that, you know, that they, we're going to talk about how to write this stuff up for the web, but a story like this that may be almost too much to process in television form you really have an opportunity afterwards when you write it up for the web to, uh, you know, to, uh, um, to give people the chance to process all that information that's out there, plus you're adding more. So we'll take a look at how you can do this for your own stories. But uh, as I'm going through the website, I'm noticing these are all the still pictures are uh, drawn from the video that we saw there. So. Uh, He's, he's pulling pictures out of the production video that was done. Yeah, by the way, what did you think of the visual quality of this, the, the B-roll? Cedar's nodding, it was good. Was it, yeah, was it better than what you usually see? You had a drone? Yeah, they had their drone. I, I like, you know, when they, they'd have the water come splash up and then they'd have the graphic of, you know, it was just very polished. Yes, it was more polished than what we would usually see, right? The B-roll, more had gone into the B-roll. Animated graphics, um, where, you know, typically you'd just see like a sort of plain font superimposed over B-roll. I mean, in this case, it's like animated graphics to drone shots. Um, this time we did have stand-ups, right? And Q&A. And Q&A. And one thing I noticed, which I don't know, I'd like to see how you guys feel about it, but the, he was on, the reporter was on, the questions almost had more time devoted to them than the SOTs. Did you notice that? I mean, especially with the guy who was, uh, this, this fellow who was doing necropsies in his dining room and stuff, he didn't have much to say. A lot of it was in the, a lot of it was in the VO. Uh, not the VO, sorry, in, in the actual asking of questions. Um, He's kind of just like stating facts and the questions and you would agree with them. Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, 
Uh, he he was on a whole lot. I Something mean, deadly is lurking in the waters. They're both in seat cover to reduce stress. <laughs> Nozzles reason. If we don't find that chore, the sharks he's are swashing ashore. <laughs> Up to 500 bat rays, hundreds of striped bass, 50 smooth hound sharks, and about 100. And we're seeing better than average graphics, uh, you know. And numbers. Selected font, true. So when you do use on-screen graphics and you actually are required in this, uh, in, in your TV package assignment, your on-screen graphics are usually best dedicated to, um, to figures, to things that are harder for people to process when they're hearing them. So this is a cue for you guys that it is relevant to your stories as well. If you do have you know, a place where you need to get across some, some information, numbers and stuff, like several numbers in a row, put it into on-screen graphics because it's easier for people to latch on to visually. You're in Halloween, all dead. So it's possible the parasite is spreading. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable uh, assumption. Investigating the cause isn't actually Okahiro's job. He's officially in charge of assessing the health of white sea bass for California's Department of Fish and Wildlife. But he's been researching shark deaths during his spare time, and he does it from home. He examines shark tissue on his dining room table. Probably have to wash this cloth before Thanksgiving. He studies bacteria samples in his kitchen and does shark necropsies on his patio. Over a thousand sharks are dead different types of sharks and fish are now getting infected. And the center of the research effort to find out why is here in your backyard. Well, in fish and wildlife, we're, we're spread pretty thin. We have a lot. OK, so <laughs> that kind of illustrates our point, I think. That, you know, he, 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 we usually write into an SOT. In this case, he's writing into then him asking a question, and then the other, you know, the SOT, the guy gets to answer very briefly. And then this is also pretty rare that we go cut person to person. Another thing, we never see any lower thirds, right? So that's, that's another specificity here, another specific thing. So no lower thirds. Um, so th there's a lot, of, a lot of different stuff about this. Um, but yeah, I think we do see also that you can, you can reach the point where people just can't get all the information that you've got to give in, the, in a television format. Um, and so they have to be careful with it. But I think it's also designed to, uh, to be consumed uh, uh, not just at the night of broadcast, but afterwards to work with uh, some web. Um, there's also uh, uh, there's a bit of a spoof, which is kind of funny, which speaks to the regular TV package. Um, so this is uh, before long. This is comedy, <laughs> but it's really very insightful in terms of Charlie Booker really has a, an exact idea of how packages are put together and made. Um, so anybody know Charlie Booker? What he does and is currently. He's the uh, producer, creative head of a series on Netflix called Black Mirror. Oh, really? Yeah. I like Black Mirror. So yeah, it's a is pretty he, cool. So he's a British guy. He's a British guy. Yeah. Uh, so before you know, spending full time on Black Mirror because of its success and and it got picked up by Netflix, so he's now in a whole different uh, uh, um, <laughs> part of the business, I guess. But he used to be a news guy at the BBC, and he would do uh, uh, satire as well. So this is, this is how to report the news, BBC Four. Before long, a standard news report visual language established itself, one that's immediately recognizable to anyone. Me has this report. It starts here, with a lackluster establishing shot of a significant location. Next, a walkie-talkie preamble from the auteur, pacing steadily towards the lens, punctuating every other sentence with a hand gesture and ignoring all the pricks milling around him like he's gliding through the f matrix before coming to a halt and posing a question. What comes next? 
often something like this, a filler shot designed to give your eyes something to look at while my voice babbles on about facts. Sometimes it'll slow down to a halt, turn monochrome and some of those facts will appear one by one on the screen. <laughs> this is followed by the obligatory shots of overweight people with their faces subtly framed out, after which the report is padded out with a selection of lazy and pointless vox pops. Um, usually get some inane chatter from people. I think they do have too much. I think. What we want to hear is actually what's happening and not what other people think of it. I, I hate these same zone bites. Yeah. That, that, I, I don't want some punter's opinion usually. <laughs> no. Another bit of dull visual abstraction to plug another gap now before the report segues gracefully into a bit of human interest courtesy of some dowdy man opening letters in a kitchen and explaining how he's been affected by the issue. When I'm watching the news, I don't really... You know, there's a person talking to me, telling me what's going on, and I don't really listen to what they're saying. It's just news. It's just news. <laughs> he unfortunately was boring, so to wake you up, this is an animated chart, this is a silhouette representing the average family, and this is a lighthouse keeper being beheaded by a laser beam. As we near the end of the report, illustrative shots of pedestrians and signs and a pipe at a window. And then the final summary, ending on a whimsical shot of something nearby, accompanied by a wry sign-off. If you're lucky, a bit of wordplay fit for a king, or in other words, a regent's treat. Charlie Brooker, Newswipe, London. Okay, there you go. So, obviously, <laughs> it's just funny, but, but he has, you know, I mean, everything is in there, right? You've got the stand-up, you've got the VO, you've got, the, you know, the on-screen graphics, which, by the way, in your script, you would indicate on-screen graphic, you'd be in the video column. Uh, so if I'm looking at a script, you've got your, right, your audio column, what people are saying, you've got the video column, and so you would write here OSG, and then, uh, you know, uh, chart of uh, population, or you could write, um, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, if it's kind of like PowerPoint bullets that come up there. Uh, so, so OSG is the way of identifying that in your script. That's the, the shorthand for that. Okay, so, so, and he has uh, the SOT with the dowdy kitchen man. He has, uh, you know, the, the lower thirds. So that would be super, right? And then dowdy kitchen man would be under there. And, um, and then just, you know, all of the, the lines that are read by the reporter there. And he had the anchor's intro at the beginning, right? So in fact, this is probably the best model of what you're trying to do. <laughs> that's, so that's it. But it's really the, it's the classic, uh, classic two-minute package there with, with graphics and stuff. Cool. All right. So that's more about what we're doing, I guess. Ooh, Charlie Brooker, 12 minutes on Donald Trump. Whoa. That looks like it might be fun to watch. <clears throat> the guy's really brilliant. So I uh, wanted to look over the exam with you. I don't know if this is, I mean, this is probably not going to be appropriate material for streaming and stuff. And uh, for those folks who are watching us uh, through the stream, if you, you know, uh, I'll, I'll have these next uh, Thursday when we all meet up. So we can just, uh, here, Nick, there's, uh, we're looking at that, and Canada. Okay. Cedar, Major, well, JP, not a lot of questions there you got wrong, so. <laughs> and I must be missing a few. You gotta find where's the rest of these? Yeah, this is a midterm exam. We're just looking over. Thank you for everyone's up. Oh, some of you folks did it online, right? Yeah. Okay, so you guys did it online. So you already know sort of what you got. And oh, yeah. I did. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yes, all right. So, uh, well, let's just look it over, see if there's any questions with uh, the folks who are in class. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not going to go through it like question by question because, you know, I think the class average was a B, and so. That would be repeating, like everybody would have got like 35 of these questions, right? But does anyone want to talk about answers, questions about the questions? Anything that you got wrong that you might want to look over? Let me check the chat. 
check anything. Again, the people uh, in chat, if they were if they were personally present, they can't see this stuff right now. Oh, okay. They want to thank you, Carmen, for providing a link uh, to the Charlie Rooker piece. So any questions about, uh, about the questions? Or online, if there's anybody online who <clears throat> did, the, did the exam online and wants clarification, I don't know. Yeah, Nika, that's true. I love to... I love to show that Charlie Brooker piece. Some of you folks have seen him already. For the football game, is it doing recording too? The camera work? I think there's only going to be one camera on it, but you could find out from Tim. I, yeah. And it'll be on EA TV? I think they're, Jody mentioned that I think that they're streaming it from the athletics department website. Oh. I don't know, I don't think it goes on EATV, but she might let us know otherwise. Uh, so, any questions about the exam? No? I can just gather them back up then, because I don't want to give these away, because then I'll have to reassemble an entire other exam next semester, and that'll be like, oh, God. You don't want us to get smarter. Well, by doing it, by studying it, that's how you get smarter. <clears throat> I'm sure this would just sit in the, a drawer after all this. There you go. All right. Any, any, uh, any questions about, about what's due for Tuesday? Sources. So <coughs> where you would be doing the informational graphics, that's where you write OSG. Right? OSG. OSG for on-screen graphic. And what would that be again? Pardon me? And what would that be again? Uh, you know, it's especially effective if you need to give information like numbers, any kind of complex information. It's easier for people to read it and get it. You know, and you can, of course, you can repeat it uh, in the in the audio and then just put up like bullet points. Um, but uh, you know. Yeah, that could be it. Cedar? Um, for, the, for the second source, if you use an interview, it would probably take form as sound on tape. But if you mm -hmm. use uh, like another article for contextual information, um, how, how would you specifically incorporate that in? And would you need to attribute it to whatever newspaper or website? You yeah, have? yeah. So uh, whenever you're using a source, you need to attribute it. Yeah. So, you know, again, just like we did in our readers, you'd say something like, you know, the Chronicle reported last year mm -hmm. that blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, you, since you're free to use whatever B-roll you want, you can either, you know, just put that information from the Chronicle in, in, your, in your VO and then, you know, kind of create B-roll for it. Or the other thing is you could do what we were seeing NBC doing, which is like showing a document, if you at least briefly. You know, I think for more than five seconds on, you know, a 2D animation of a video document or something with, you know, you know what they did to make it more interesting was they highlighted it right. or something like that. So you could use that too if you want. So that's, those are your, your options basically when taking something from a document. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you might just use the information, but be sure to attribute it. In the VO. In the VO, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you could also do it in the visual as well. If you are, you know, featuring it, you could do a, a lower third to sort of saying, you know, chronicle, uh, oh, okay. something like that. Yeah, the main thing is you attribute it, for sure. Yeah. So that's a good question. And other, you know, thinking of the specific things you're going to want to put into the TV version. Other questions? I should check the chat too. Folks may have some ideas here. Not seeing any questions being asked. Okay. Uh, well, let's break up, you know, a little early today. And if anybody wants to stick around and ask, you know, quite just like specifically, and you don't want to talk in front of everybody and on camera and stuff, that's fine too. So otherwise, I'll see you Tuesday. So it's due Tuesday. So we'll, we'll start reading those, uh, especially for the people who are actually present in class. And then Thursday, we'll read everybody else's. I'm looking forward to hearing about this. That'll be good.